Welcome to my SOS talk on quantum computing. My name is Torsten Hopper from ETH Zurich, and I will get started right away by uh, sharing my slides. So um, I'm going to talk today about a brief overview of quantum computing for systems researchers. So most of us are, in fact, uh, systems researchers coming from a high-performance computing background, and I'm one of those. And I want to uh, especially thank the Microsoft Quantum team with Matthias Treuer, Martin Rötteler, and Thomas Hähner, and many others for uh, teaching me pretty much everything I know about quantum computation. But of course, every wrong statement I make during this talk is fully attributable to me. Then I also want to thank my students, David Ita and Niels Kleinig, um, for uh, helping with the research work on this, of course. So quantum computing is a very interesting field. It has been overhyped or hyped for many, many, many years. And, and uh, analysts are now indicating that the market may be more than $1.7 trillion uh, in 2026. And China is indicating that there may be a quantum computer existing because there's already a quantum operating system that is challenging the United States. Um, furthermore, Quantum computing is poised to transform the big data landscape, which I doubt, as you will see in this talk, I will give you some arguments against this. And then it may even control our traffic, uh, control our very life, uh, which uh, may or may not be uh, realistic, but we will see. So some of the contributions that uh, I and my group have done to quantum computing contain, um, together with in a collaboration with uh, Microsoft, um, the uh, some optimization of quantum programs based on assertions, uh, concretely horror logic, the first true quantum optimization, in fact, quantum compiler optimization. Um, then we have counted the number of uh, needed lines or ancilla qubits in order to make functions reversible and provide a very simple lower bound um, proof for this. So it's, it's quite nice or lower bound estimate. And recently we have looked at what would a quantum internal representation actually be based on a quantum, uh, based on a data flow data flow models such as MLIR or LLVM in this last paper. So, but today I want to not go into too much technical depth on any of these works because this is uh, requiring a, a, a lot of understanding on the site where I'm not sure if, if I should just give a, rather give an, an overview of quantum computing so that we can all speak the same language and then we can dive deeper during the discussion sessions into the specifics of quantum computing or specific results. So first, what is a qubit? Well, we all know what a bit is. So a bit can be zero or one. It's the smallest state, uh, the smallest piece of information we have. And now we can actually write a bit as so-called one-hot encoding in machine learning in a two-dimensional space. So the zeros are in general, the ith element is, is one if the bit is, is i. So here we have only two. So we have uh, one and two. Then we can draw it in a two-dimensional space. This works really well on slides. Uh, we can now draw the, the one in the uh, vertical direction and the zero in the horizontal direction pointing towards east. Um, now I can generalize this to a quantum state because as we all know, quantum bits can be in the superposition uh, kind of simultaneously in the zero and one state. And the intensity or the probability when I observe the uh, one of those uh, qubits in either zero or one is um, reflected in a, in a so-called amplitude, which in this case is alpha zero for um, zero and alpha one for one. And these amplitudes square are actually probabilities, which means that all the amplitudes square summed up equal one. And this in this two dimensional visualization forms the unit circle. So now a quantum state like this psi here could for example be here if both of them are negative, um, the, the alphas. So then I can rename these states to be more convenient in, in the so-called parquet notation. In this case, it's a ket here with zero and one so that we don't have to write very long vectors because these vectors will be of size two to the n for n for a quantum system with n bits. And then this is the very famous plus state, which is really where the qubit is absolutely undecided between zero and one. So it's a 50-50 chance to go into either of those states when measured. This is great. Um, so now you can argue, or I could argue that we can actually encode a lot of information in these alpha zeros in these amplitudes and alpha ones here. Um, unfortunately, um, I can only extract one bit out of a single quantum bit when I measure it. So that we can encode a lot of information, but we cannot really measure a lot of information. <laughs> so we can exactly measure uh, from an n-bit quantum system, we can measure n bits because there is a very restricted access function to this quantum state and I cannot copy a quantum state. If you could copy it, then you can simply sample it and, and get the uh, probability distribution um, uh, reverse engineered, so to say, but unfortunately we can also not copy it. Um, so, however, it's still pretty powerful because n qubits live in a vector space of two to the n with this formulation that I discussed here, right? And we can write this shortly as the sum of these uh, alpha i's and then each of the states 
from going from zero to two to the n minus one. So for two bits, the possible combinations, as we all know, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. And then we have four different, so two to the n, two to the two in this case, um, four different alphas that encode the probability distribution. Alpha is, by the way, a complex number in, in general quantum computation. So now I can demonstrate you how to actually implement an adder circuit that adds two to the n numbers in log n time. So you all know a classical adder, which takes two numbers, two n-bit numbers, uh, a and b, and outputs a sum and a carry bit. And it does this in logarithmic depth and linear work. So we can feed in specific numbers here and get a specific output. A quantum adder, just believe me, we can do the same thing. We can uh, implement an adder with logarithmic depth and linear work. We have um, part of the quantum state, the number A, an n-bit number, and part of the quantum state, a number B. The initial quantum state is almost always for a quantum algorithm zero. Um, and then we have a set of additional bits that we, we call ancilla or, or garbage bits or, or additional helper bits that I don't want to talk about. But this is exactly the, the second paper that I mentioned in my introduction that we've been working on to assess for a given function, like this adder, for example, what is the minimum number of needed bits to uh, ensure uh, reversibility that is actually required by quantum computations. Um, so we can talk about this later if you want. So then we have um, usually the first function in the, uh, on the quantum state is a set of Hadamard gates, which puts the quantum state from the all zero state in the completely undecided state. So basically any bit pattern is equally likely in this uh, completely undecided Hadamard, um, Hadamard transformed state. So then we have uh, the final state after the adder, which is really the sum of the two. So it's the, uh, the uh, A itself is on the top bits, but then A plus B is on the remaining bits. And then we have additional garbage bits, which we don't really care about what they do, but we need them uh, to express the problem in a quantum mechanical formulation. So here an example with uh, two two-bit numbers. So here you see the, the input state um, to the adder. And then the, the output state is, of course, A on the first n bits and A plus B in the second n bits. And then there's a carry bit as well. But now the question is, how do we get to this state? Well, the only way to get to this state is to actually measure it, uh, to transform it into the classical world where we live in, where we can observe the state, we can print it on a specific device, and we can look at it. But as soon as we do this, we will actually destroy the quantum state, and we will get one particular a choice for A and B as the inputs. And then of course the correct A and the A plus B and C as the outputs, but we cannot choose that choice. So basically it's an arbitrary bit pattern that we get as an input. And of course the correct A plus B as an output, but it could be this, it could be this, it could be any bit pattern. Uh, we have absolutely no influence on this for this particular um, construction. So that's not such a useful adder. In fact, that somewhat generalizes um, to uh, um, using Kolevo's uh, theorem that essentially at most n classical bits can be extracted from a quantum state with n qubits. This is what we are doing. Even though that specific quantum system requires two to the n minus one complex number, so at least bits, to be represented. Okay, so that's unfortunate. And actually uh, my, my personal view on this, uh, we could have a corollary to this corollary is that uh, the practical quantum algorithm must read a small input in brackets linear size and modify a very large, in brackets, exponential size quantum state, so to get a speed up, because these quantum computers are relatively slow compared to classical computers, um, that the correct polynomial size output, in brackets, is likely to be measured. So very small input, very large search space that we are searching with this uh, quantum computing device, and then relatively small output again. Um, because we will need n operations to encode the input and the output we can only measure once and, and we get our result. Uh, and this is also only n operations if you have n qubits. So really what this means, quantum algorithms are good at solving problems where the solution is verifiable efficiently in polynomial time. Uh, is this true? Well, we are probably reminded of a class of algorithms that are NP-complete problems, uh, where I was very excited uh, to join the quantum team and I thought we would be solving many of those. Uh, of course, I was proven wrong, uh, not so fast. It's, it seems that P unequals NP even for quantum computers uh, limited by, uh, by the linearity of these operators. Of course, we can tell for sure because we don't know whether P is unequal NP for classical computers and quantum computers are at least as uh, powerful as classical computers. However, uh, it, uh, there's a lot of indication that it's not easy at least. Yet there is an interesting theoretical complexity class, the bounded error quantum polynomial time algorithms. By the way, all quantum algorithms are um, probabilistic algorithms, so you sample them but with very high probability to give you a correct result. And as we just mentioned, this result is almost always easily verifiable whether it's correct or not. Um, 
And this is strictly more powerful than the bounded error probabilistic polynomial time algorithm. So probabilistic algorithms are pretty powerful, but quantum algorithms are even more powerful because you, you can have negative um, or negative amplitudes. So two amplitudes added together could actually get the result of zero, which is impossible for probabilistic computers. So that's main part of the power of quantum algorithms here in, in, this, in this thinking model. So if you now draw the, the number of algorithms uh, solvable in polynomial space, you of course know that the non-deterministic the polynomial solvable algorithms, so the ones that can be checked in polynomial time or verified, is a subset of those. We also know that the ones that can be constructed in polynomial time is, of course, a subset of those. We also know that the NP-complete problems is a subset of the NP class. We do not know whether NP equals uh, the NP-complete class or equals the P class in classical as well as in quantum, of course. But we do know that the BQP set of algorithms, so the algorithms that are solvable on a quantum computer in polynomial time um, bound with, with a bounded error, is larger than P and is also larger than the ones that can be solved with a probabilistic polynomial time algorithm, where we basically assume a, a random number generator. So the examples that, that, that we know or, um, that we can construct is factoring in discrete uh, logarithm uh, algorithms, which based on quantum Fourier transform. So, is another interesting set of uh, algorithms, which is drawing from the NP intermediate class. So these are not NP complete or not known to be NP complete. And these are also not known to be solvable in polynomial time. So we don't really know where they belong. Um, and it's not clear if those like graph isomorphism, for example, is actually solvable on a quantum computer or not. So there are lots of interesting open problems for uh, theory researchers on the algorithm side in the quantum computing area. But as I mentioned, I'm a systems uh, researcher. And, and most of us are probably systems uh, researchers. So how do we build real quantum algorithms? How do we write a quantum code? And unfortunately, <laughs> to, to my surprise, quantum algorithms are extremely complex and, and somehow weird. It takes a, a, some time to get used to it, at least for me, what these algorithms do. And in fact, most of the algorithms that I've seen, most of the programs, they base on a very small number of fundamental algorithms. Many of these fundamental algorithms or building blocks, I would call them, is actually based, even named uh, on the inventor. And only every, uh, every decade or so, there are at most two of these algorithms invented. So for example, Grover's algorithms, or uh, sorry, Grover's algorithm, or Shor's algorithm, and so on. Um, so there's only a handful, maybe two handful of these basic building blocks, and we derive everything else from those, because it is so hard to come up with a good quantum algorithm. And to give you a little bit of an intuition, I want to show you one quick example of one specific algorithm, Grover's search, which in my opinion is the simplest, somewhat useful algorithm. We will see it's not really too useful, unfortunately, but it's, it's still the simplest that I can explain in a single slide in a couple of minutes. Uh, the idea of Grover's search is that we have a black box function f of x, which we are not allowed to look at the structure of the function, but we can evaluate it. So the function accepts cer uh, certain inputs from a domain d and produces certain outputs in, a uh, in, in an image uh, C. So the set of valid inputs is D, the set of valid outputs is C. So now I get the task. I have a function uh, invocation for some variable X that is evaluated to Y. And I want to know X. And let's assume this function is bijective, right? just uh, for simplicity. So really what I want to do is I want to invert f of x, but of course I can't really look at it. So f of x may be doing anything, but I'm not allowed to check. I can just invoke it, which means classically, I need uh, with, prob with high probability sampling at least uh, the cardinality of d half queries or O of d queries in the classical computing world. Interestingly, in the quantum computing world, I can do this with square root of d. Uh, of the size of d, which is which is quite cool. And let me show the algorithm uh, because it's quite simple in Q sharp. That's the Microsoft uh, quantum language, which I highly recommend looking at. It's a very highly productive language. I wrote this example code in, in a couple of hours and I can even explain it to you in a couple of minutes. So what we first do here, it looks like normal C code in some sense, well, inspired by F sharp, but it's like normal imperative code. What we first do, is we allocate logarithm of the size of our domain many qubits because that's what we were going to feed in. Remember, we're going to work on a superposition of all possible inputs to this function at the same time. So we need log n many of those bits. Um, these bits are initially all zero. So going from zero, zero, zero to one, one, one. But of course, all these bits, so the probability distribution as we're seeing here for all of them being zero is one and everything else is zero. Well, the first thing we do in most quantum programs that I've seen is we apply these Hadamard uh, gates 
to each of the qubits individually, which means we we transform them into a so-called uniform superposition that any bit pattern is equally likely now. So, and the likelihood of each is of course one divided by square root of two to the n. Well, that's the amplitude and the square of this is the likelihood. Um, then we are moving into the so-called Grover iteration. And then there's one trick that you just have to believe me, it's not too hard, but I don't have time to explain it, is you can implement an oracle of this f of x function in quantum computing in a quantum computer that will flip the amplitude of the correct y output, right? Okay, so by flipping, it just negates it. And then there is a second operator that's called the Grover diffusion operator, which what it does, it's, it's also relatively simple to explain. Um, it reflects each of these amplitudes at the average of all of the amplitudes. So this is now the average because we flipped one, of course, it's, it's below uh, the original average. And now we, reflect on this average. So those will all go down proportionally and this at the bottom will go up proportionally. So now we keep doing this. Uh, we apply the Oracle, which will again negate the, um, the correct output. And we apply this diffusion operator again. Now we can see why it's called diffusion operator because it really diffuses all of the not relevant input states down to close to zero. And if we keep doing this square root n times, we will have a very high probability of observing the correct output state. Right, this is Grover's algorithm, and then we are done. So now the question is, well, this is, is this as simple as I explained it? Of course, it's not because you need to map this to a real machine, all these systems aspects and all the quantum error correction and whatnot. And actually, if you wanted to, let's say, invert the AES function, so an, an, an encryption function, you will in practice not go much further than about 50, maybe 60 uh, bits today. So that is not satisfactory uh, given a reasonable quantum computer. In fact, if you want to crack the real AES algorithms, uh, colleagues have done uh, a, a study on this, it would still take a very, very long time. So AES is secure for now as um, most symmetric key uh, um, schemes. Asymmetric key schemes can be broken with Grover, so they're not super secure, but symmetric key schemes, at least I don't know that they're super um, vulnerable to this attack. So now, one last point I wanted to make is that actually Grover is not enough for pretty much any algorithm that you could imagine for near-term quantum computers, because it only gives you quadratic speed up. So let us do a thought experiment that we implement a classical computing device and we compare it with an optimistic quantum computer that I hope to see in the next 10 years or maybe my lifetime. Um, so our classical computing device is an A100, which we all know and love. Um, so this A100 has about 10 terabit per second IO, um, 195 teraops per second FP16 bandwidth, uh, nearly 100 teraops in 32 and 5,000 teraops um, logical, so binary operations, at least if we would implement it with the same chip technology. Then we have our lovely competitor quantum computer here. Um, that has one gigabit per second IO. As I mentioned, it's quite hard to create quantum states. We do have another paper appearing at the uh, design automation conference uh, this year on creating sparse quantum states, which is also not super simple. Um, but this computer, in addition to the IO limit, also has a, a throughput limit. Like it can only do 7,000 operations or 98,000 operations for FP16 uh, and N32 respectively. And on the logical side, it's also not extremely strong. So your A100 is now wondering, why am I even competing against this thing? Why are people inventing, uh, investing millions of dollars? They can just buy me for, I don't know, the cost of my car, I guess. Um, so it's still not cheap, but it's also not millions of dollars. But now the quantum computer, as we just mentioned, only needs to evaluate the function square root n times. Well, well, this guy needs to evaluate it n times, essentially, to implement the Grover algorithm or any quadratic speedup. So quite interesting uh, speedup possibilities. So polynomial, not exponential. And this is just one algorithm. It's the most versatile one. So now we assume a two-week runtime, like we allow these two computers to compete in a two-week time window. How many instructions can this Oracle function contain such that the quantum computer actually outperforms the A100 or a comparable chip? Right? That's a valid question. It's not so super easy to answer it, but I give you just a result. And we have a paper forthcoming on this um, that will appear as an opinion article. So for the quadratic Grover speedup, unfortunately, only 0.1 operation. So not even a single FP16 or N32 operation could be included in my Oracle or 71 binary. If we had cubic speedup, where we know no such algorithm that is as generic as the Grover algorithm, um, we can have 25,000, 16,000, or even 730 million. So much more realistic. But unfortunately, we don't know a, a Grover-style algorithm. So 
I want to close my talk with a, an outlook towards real applications, towards nice applications that I'm really looking forward to, like quantum chemistry and quantum physics. It's the original idea by Feynman. Uh, breaking encryption, I'm not looking forward to this, but this will definitely happen at least as a one-shot application. And uh, accelerating heuristical solvers, where a qu quantum speed up, uh, a quadratic speed up can be powerful, but it needs to be uh, needs to have a very detailed resource analysis, as I mentioned, is probably not too uh, realistic. Um, and then quantum machine learning, which is the most foggy one for me, because most of these algorithms are in fact Grover style, only polynomial speed up algorithms, only quadratic in many cases. Um, but in theory, the uh, function that a quantum circuit can implement is so complex that it cannot be simulated easily. So why should we not be able to use this as well for quantum computations, uh, for quantum machine learning to encode several features? Some people even say the brain uses quantum effects, so this could be um, exploited in a quantum computer. So thank you very much. I want to uh, thank my colleagues at uh, Microsoft's Quantum who, who taught me pretty much everything, and I'm still on a path to understand better what is going on. Thank you, and I'm happy to, ask, uh, to answer any questions offline or during the sessions.